Welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Close Reads Podcast Network. I'm David Kern. Today is January 13th, 2020. This is, I believe, my first appearance here on The Daily Poem this year. I apologize um, for the sporadic amount of uh, publishing this podcast. Right after Christmas, my family and I all came down with a solid bout of the flu and that threw this podcast and everything else in my life kind of for a loop. But I'm back. I want to say thank you to Heidi White for filling in for me ably a couple times to make sure that we gave you at least some poems. But I'm back and I'm uh, happy to bring you some new poems this week. For today's poem, I'm going to read you one by an American poet named Carl Shapiro. He lived from 1913 to 2000. He was the fifth poet laureate in 1946. Also won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1945 and the Bollinger Prize in 1969. And the poem that I'm going to read to you today is called California Winter. It goes like this. It is winter in California, and outside is like the interior of a florist's shop. A chilled and moisture-laden crop of pink camellias lines the path, and what rare roses for a banquet or a bride so multitudinous that they seem a glut. A line of snails crosses the golf green lawn from the rose bushes to the ivy bed. An arsenic compound is distributed for them. The gardener will rake up the shells and leave in a corner of the patio a little mound of empty snails like skulls. By noon, the fog is burnt off by the sun, and the world's immensest sky opens a page for the exercises of a future age. Now jet planes draw straight lines, parabolas, and X's, which the wind, before they're done, erases leisurely or pulls to fuzz. It is winter in the Valley of the Vine. The vineyards crucified on stakes suggest war cemeteries, but the fruit is pressed. The redwood vats are brimming in the shed, and on the sidings stand tank cars of wine, for which bright juice a billion grapes have bled. And skiers from the snow line driving home descend through almond orchards, olive farms, fig tree, and palm tree, everything that warms the imagination of the wintertime. If the walls were older, one would think of Rome. If the land were stonier, one would think of Spain. But this land grows the oldest living things, trees that were young when pharaohs ruled the world, trees whose new leaves are only just unfurled. Beautiful they are not. They oppress the heart with gigantism and with immortal wings, and yet one feels the sumptuousness of this dirt. It is raining in California, a straight rain cleaning the heavy oranges on the bough, filling the gardens till the gardens flow, shining the olives, tiling the gleaming tile, waxing the dark camellia leaves more green, flooding the day-long valleys like the Nile. So after Shapiro died, apparently an editor or an executor of his accounts and his will or something like that discovered a, a treasure trove of poems that he had written uh, for three different categories. Uh, one were poems to his his wife when he died, poems concerning roses, and then other various poems. So there's three sort of categories. And I wanted to bring this up because of that, that section, Poems Concerning Roses. And we can see from the get-go uh, just how much uh, Shapiro loves flowers and roses in this particular poem. It shows up right away. Because the second line of the poem is, is like the interior of a florist shop, referring to outside. But it talks about uh, pink camellias lining the path and rare roses. Um, and it talks about um, how the gardener is sort of trying to preserve those flowers. And I'm I'm really uh, intrigued by the image of this gardener who is trying to you know kill off the snails, the line of of snails that are crossing the golf green lawn um, from the rose bushes to the ivy bed. He uses arsenic to to poison them and then makes a big pile of them. So it's winter and he's trying to preserve, try to keep these beautiful flowers alive. And it takes a lot of effort. In fact, it takes killing another creature to keep these flowers alive. And then in the third stanza. Uh, the third of seven, sta- of seven stanzas, we get a sort of n- another flowering image where we get, uh, by noon the fog is burnt off by the sun and the world's immense sky opens a page for the exercises of a future age. This seems like a turning point in the poem, even as it's sort of continuing the, the imagery of flowering, right? The, the opening, like opening a page, to me almost has this sort of flowering 
uh, idea that's being continued here. And yet, the poem gets into a much more abstract place here, it seems as well. The exercises of a future age, and there's a semicolon, and then it's jet planes drawing straight lines, parabolas, and X's, which the wind, before they're done, erases. So, you know, these first three stanzas are very sort of observational. And then it seems like we get a reset, so we get a similar line to the beginning of the first stanza, here in the fourth stanza. The first line, the first stanza, it, is, it says, it is winter in California. And then here we get, it is winter in the Valley of the Vine. That's how our fourth stanza begins. <clears throat> and we begin to get this, this uh, much more sort of dour imagery. We get the, the idea of vineyards crucified on stakes that suggest war cemeteries, like in Arlington, the white headstones. But the fruit is pressed into wine, which the uh, which which billions of grapes have have given their lives uh, to become. And then we hear about skiers who are driving along through through orchards. When, you know, their imaginations are being warmed by these things that they're driving by in the winter time. Then we get this line: If the walls were older, one would think of Rome. If the land were stonier, one would think of Spain. And he begins to he begins to place California. He begins to place this place that he's looking at within this this bigger picture, this history of the world, um, within a context that's greater than the moment that he's living in. And then in the seventh stanza, we get a bit of a reset again, and it says, "It is raining in California, just like it had said at the beginning. It is winter, and the rain is cleaning the oranges, filling the gardens so that the gardens will flow, shining the olives, making the tiles gleam." And we get this sort of reset back to the the tone of the first three stanzas. But the last the last line then once again places it in something larger, flooding the day long valleys like the Nile. And so it's he he's he it's it's basically he's doing he's drawing a simple comparison in some ways. You know, he's saying uh, this place is like this place. He's seeing what he sees. And that is leading his imagination to place the things that he sees in a, in a larger context, within a greater story. And so just as the poem seems like it's starting to sort of reset again, really it's about what it's always been about. And that's surprising and pleasing at, at the same time. It's, uh, it's what gives uh, the meat, or maybe it's the marrow <laughs> to a poem like this that makes it worth, uh, I don't know, chewing on, if I can pursue that metaphor i'll read it one more time for you california winter by carl shapiro it is winter in california and outside is like the interior of a florist shop a chilled and moisture laden crop of pink camellias lines the path and what rare roses for a banquet or a bride so multitudinous that they seem a glut a line of snails crosses the golf green lawn from the rose bushes to the ivy bed an arsenic compound is distributed for them. The gardener will rake up the shells and leave in a corner of the patio the little mound of empty snails like skulls. By noon, the fog is burnt off by the sun and the world's immensest sky opens a page for the exercises of a future age. Now jet planes draw straight lines, parabolas and X's, which the wind, before they're done, erases leisurely or pulls to fuzz. And it's winter in the Valley of the Vine. The vineyards crucified on stakes suggest war cemeteries, but the fruit is pressed, the redwood vats are brimming in the shed, and on the siding stand tank cars of wine for which bright juice a billion grapes have bled. And skiers from the snow line driving home descend through almond orchards, olive farms, fig tree, and palm tree, everything that warms the imagination of the wintertime. If the walls were older, one would think of Rome. If the land were stonier, one would think of Spain. But this land grows the oldest living things, trees that were young when pharaohs ruled the world, trees whose new leaves are only just unfurled. Beautiful they are not. They oppress the heart with gigantism and with immortal wings. And yet one feels the sumptuousness of this dirt. It is raining in California, a straight rain, cleaning the heavy oranges on the bough, filling the gardens till the gardens flow shining the olives, tiling the gleaming tile, waxing the dark camellia leaves more green, flooding the day-long valleys like the Nile. This has been The Daily Poem. Thanks so much for listening. Be back tomorrow with another